After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. And so in this particular chapter, chapter 18 of the book of Acts, two churches are going to be birthed. And these are churches that we are familiar with because we see them in the New Testament. We see that letters were written to them, the church of Corinth and the church of Ephesus. Now, we don't know how long Paul remained in the city of Athens because chapter 17 records how he had been there in the city of Athens. It could have been more than a month. It could have been as many as two months. We know that while in Athens he had sent a message to Timothy and also to Silas, we saw that in chapter 17, verse 15, where Paul had told them to come to him with all speed, and they had departed. We know that Timothy was in Berea, and that that would have been a 500-mile round-trip journey from Athens. That means it would have taken time for Timothy and Silas to come to Athens. Eventually, as we looked in chapter 17, Paul had left Athens. He went to the city, the city of Corinth. Now, Corinth is only 40 miles southwest west of the uh, city of Athens. They would, usually they would uh, take uh, either walk or they would ride on a, a donkey or a horse. It would usually take them two days to travel 40 miles because you would travel 20 miles a day. And he came to the city of Corinth. Now, when you look in ancient history, the city of Corinth was a beautiful city. It was a harbor city. It was an extremely prosperous city and was well known. Uh, the commerce in Corinth was incredible. They had luxury items that were sold in the marketplaces. They sold things like Arabian balsam or Egyptian papyrus. They had ivory from Libya, carpets from Babylon, wool from like Onia, and all of that was sold in Corinth. But the city was also known for lust and for degradation. During that day, if I wanted to insult somebody, I would say, you're a Corinthian. And that was a great insult because they were known for their depravity. It was known for degradation. They had a temple there dedicated to Aphrodite. And the temple of Aphrodite had a thousand religious prostitutes who nightly would seduce sailors and tourists. It was an opulent city but it was one of the most disgusting places in the entire world. Now, Paul is there in the city of Corinth, and he needs to find work in order to support himself. And that work is, is going to um, be provided when he meets up with a Jewish couple, the Jewish couple, Aquila and Priscilla. According to verse 2, they had been kicked out of Rome, along with other Jews, and they had gone to Corinth. It may have been that there were riots taking place or insurrection in Rome, but for whatever reason, the Jews were no longer welcome there. And so, according to verse 3, because they were of the same trade, he stayed with them. And he worked because he, by occupation, was a tent maker. Let me say something very briefly about this. Jewish boys would learn their father's trade, even if these boys were going to become rabbis. Paul was able to work with his hands, and Paul would provide for his own needs, and he did so by making tents. So God gave him a trade and an opportunity for him to be able to take care of himself. And he wasn't above working with his own hands to supply for his own necessities. In the book of Acts, in chapter 20, we'll see this uh, in verses 33 through 35. Paul said it like this. He said, I haven't coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the word of the Lord Jesus himself, who said it is more blessed to give than to receive. So he said, I haven't coveted anything. Money, I haven't coveted clothing, I haven't coveted any of those things. I worked with my own hands. And so that's what he's doing. He's a tent maker. Now, in verse four, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit 
and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. And so this is what an evangelist does. He takes the gospel and he presents it to other people. Notice in verse 4, he reasoned in the synagogue every, every Sabbath and persuaded both Jew and Gentile. That's what evangelists do. He took the message. It's interesting to note that he's taken this message not simply to the lost. We saw that in Acts 17, where he spoke to the Greek philosophers. But he would also take this message to the religiously lost. And there are a lot of religious lost people. A lot of people who, who go to church, a lot of people who go to their, their temple or go to mosque, they, they go for religious services, but they're still lost. And so he would take the message throughout the world, including to the religious people, and that's what he would do. He went into the synagogue and he reasoned every Sabbath and he was persuading them. Well, in Corinth, he went into the synagogue. Once again, he shares the gospel and that's his pattern. He's preaching the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. And incidentally, I'll say this too as I lay a foundation. That's what preachers are supposed to do. Proclaim Jesus Christ. I keep saying the same thing to this church. Some of you may be getting tired of hearing this, but it's true and I'll say it again. We're living in a time when people no longer endure healthy teaching. They heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they voluntarily turn aside from the truth and they turn unto fables. They wanna hear stories and not scripture. And that's a fact, there's no doubt about that. Now remember when, when Paul was in Athens, remember how Paul had reasoned with these intellectuals, the Stoic and Epicurean philosophers, and how he had even quoted their own pagan philosophers, speaking to them concerning the things that they, as a society and culture, had embraced. But remember also that in his, in his uh, giving them an opportunity to embrace by faith Jesus as Lord and Savior, there was very there is very little response. It says in verse 34 of chapter 17, some men joined him and believed, among them Dionysius the Oropagite, a woman named Damaris and others with him, but there wasn't much of a response. And so now he's in Corinth and it appears that he has determined something. He's gonna make sure to preach the message of the gospel. Now when he wrote the letter to, the first letter to the Corinthians, it's found in chapter two of 1 Corinthians, uh, verses one through five. This is what he told the Corinthians. He said, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. I came to you, Corinthians, and I brought to you not stories, myths, and not persuasive words. I brought to you Jesus Christ and him crucified, because it's in believing Christ and his death for us that a person is saved. And so there he is proclaiming the message and the power of the gospel. In verse five, it says, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, notice Paul was compelled by the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Compelled means to be compressed internally. It speaks of an inner pressure that motivated him. His heart was on fire. And he was compelled, he was compelled to speak. Have you ever been in that place? where you know that God is saying, open your big mouth and say something? Yeah. Have you ever been there? It's, it's, and then you say, mm, it's class, I'm in class. I'm in college, it happened in college. It would happen in, I didn't always go to Christian college, I went to secular school. And I would be there and, uh, or I'd, sometimes I've gone to Bible studies, you know, and the teacher is teaching error. And, and my, mom, I, I, my mom saw this happen more than once with me. I actually felt compelled to speak. I would, I, would, I would sit there and I would begin to almost sweat. And I'd be thinking, and I'd talk, my, talk to myself and I'd say, shut up, 
Don't say anything. You're not supposed, you're not the teacher. Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Jeremiah 20, verse 9. I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back. I could not. That was the Apostle Paul. That was Paul. These people were lost. They're in need of Christ. He's an evangelist. He didn't go in there and, and, and give them something cool to think about. He didn't try and be the, the cool evangelist, you know. He went in there with the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the truth that sets you free. In 2 Samuel 23, 2, the spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. And that was the apostle Paul. And there he is, compelled by the spirit. He testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Verse 6, but when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. It says they opposed him in verse 6. That word means to systematically oppose. It, it, it is a picture of putting themselves in a warlike order against them. They systematically and ho with hostility opposed him. It says they blasphemed. The word blasphemed means to speak reproach. Uh, fully. It, it speaks to revile. They were willfully rejecting the gospel. What they were saying is this message that this man is bringing is worthless and it's unnecessary. That's called blasphemy. And as they were saying that, and, and you can almost hear it. I mean, we're, we're in such an antiseptic environment. He wasn't speaking to a lot of people who agreed with him. He was speaking to people who disagreed. And you can see what's happening today. All you need to do is watch the news and watch what happens. And I'll, I'll put it in political terms, but it doesn't have to be this way. But I'll use the word conservative. Be a conservative and go to Berkeley and get a hall as an invited speaker and see how many people sit there respectfully and listen to what you have to say. It's not going to happen. Because from place to place, whenever somebody comes in who's saying something that others disagree with, instead of politely listening to them and then differing on points and speaking to them, asking questions and arguing in a polite way, they just riot, they just scream, they shout you down. That's the picture you need to have of what is taking place here. It wasn't a polite conversation like I'm basically having with you right now. It was people yelling and saying, we don't need this nonsense. This is crazy. What do you mean, Jesus? That's what was going on. So that was Paul. That's one of the reasons why I admire this man so much. He had a strength from the Spirit of God, and he was willing to go in a lion's den, if necessary, to speak the truth, and that's what he was doing. And so as this is happening, he says, your blood be on your own, your own heads. In other words, you are responsible for what happens to yourself as well as to your nation. You have resisted, you have rejected the message, and you have done so to your own hurt. So he's saying, I am clean, I am innocent of what the result of this rejection will be. I don't have blood guilt. In Ezekiel 3, 18 and 19, it reads, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked, from his wicked way to save his life. That same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. If you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness nor turn from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity. You have delivered your soul. Your responsibility, Ezekiel, is you're a watchman intended to cry out in my name. That's your responsibility. If they turn, that's good. If they don't, at least you did what you're supposed to do. And that's what he's doing. He's saying, you are guilty of your own blood. So I'm going to take this message to the Gentiles, to these Corinthians. They will listen. Here's a, a simple thing. Sometimes you must simply move on 
and leave people in the hands of the Lord. You don't cast your pearls before swine. There are times when you simply shake the dust off of your sandals like Jesus taught us in Matthew 10 and you go to people who are receptive. You don't stay spinning your wheels with people who reject. You just move on and that's what Paul was doing. I'm going to preach the good news to the Corinthian Gentiles. You see, we resist the Spirit of God by not yielding to his conviction. And when you resist his conviction, you are opposing yourself. In other words, you're cutting yourself off from the possibility of salvation. The writer of Hebrews said it like this in chapter 3, verses 7 and the first portion of verse 8. The Holy Ghost says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. So you have that responsibility. You hear the message and you have the responsibility to receive or you also can turn away, but it's up to you and it's left on your own shoulders for the decisions that you make. I'm going to the Gentiles, he says. Verse 7, and he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justus, one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. So this is a Gentile. Then Crispus, Crispus is interesting. He had a real Dark sunburn, that's why they called him Crispus. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's the original Greek. No, I'm teasing you. Crispus, <laughs> I don't know. The ruler of the synagogue believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. And so you have a man named Justus, and He's a worshiper of God. That speaks of him being a Gentile, and he lives next door to the synagogue. But you also have Crispus, who is the synagogue ruler, and he was converted. And notice again, he is the one who believed on the Lord. And so that's taking place. Verse 9, the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent. For I am with you. And no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Do not be afraid. Do not keep silent. The Jews began at that time to physically oppose Paul. They were doing whatever was necessary to silence him. And here's something that has encouraged me even this great apostle, this man who made it his aim to preach the message of Christ in places that no one had ever heard, even this great man who went on missionary journey after missionary journey after missionary journey. Three missionary journeys are recorded in the book of Acts alone. A man who went as far as he could to preach the gospel, a man who spoke concerning the various things he suffered for the gospel's sake, hunger, being shipwrecked, beaten. He was stoned. So many painful things, ridiculed. And, and I've always admired him. I've thought this man was the most amazing man outside of Jesus Christ. And yet he had already said to the Corinthians, I was with you in fear. And the Lord speaks to him and says, don't be afraid. I'm with you. So this man, even this great apostle, was afraid. And the Lord needed to comfort him. So don't feel bad. Because I think some of you can. I, the way I, way I teach, you know, I, I say, blah, 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 blah. And then you can say, oh, but I'm nervous. I get nervous. You know, we all do. I've been asked before, Pastor, do you get nervous when you teach? And the answer is, sometimes I do. Sometimes I do, yeah. Do I often know? Here, no, this is my family. I'm speaking to my family. I don't get nervous with my own church. But have I? Yes. Have I been afraid? Have I had my heart trembling before? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, what do you do when you're afraid? You close your eyes, you say a quick prayer, and you say, be with me, Lord, here we go. And you open your mouth. Have I been ridiculed? All the time. All the time. You think it happens now? It does. Yes. 
Yes. Have I been ridiculed in classes where I've shared about Jesus with non-believers? Yeah. Have people tried to make me look stupid? I do a pretty good job on my own. I don't need help from others. <laughs> but I'll be honest with you, yes, of course. Of course. Of course I've been made to feel stupid. Of course I have walked out saying that was not what I wanted to say. Of course. So what do you do? Do you stop speaking? No. You just say, God, help me to learn. I'm going to continue because somebody has to. And you called me to. And he called us to. Because you will be so blessed to know that there are people that when you share with, they are people that God had already had a divine appointment with them. And all he needed was you at that moment to say something. And they're ready to come to faith in Christ. You be blessed and surprised by that. So yes, Paul would be a bit afraid. He was afraid. And the Lord spoke to him. And he said, I'm giving you comfort. In Hebrews 13, verse 5, it reads, Keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. Because God has said, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? So he says, Do not be afraid, but speak. Do not Keep silent, for I am with you. That reminds me of Jeremiah 1, 6 through 8, where it reads, Then said I, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak. I'm a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I'm a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, saith the Lord. So Paul could speak with conviction because he knew the Lord was there with him. He had fear initially, but God gave him confidence. Jesus strengthened him, and the scripture here tells us he remained there 18 months because Jesus intended to save many people. Now, as this is taking place, verse 12, when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. It's also called the Bema seat, saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there'd be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves. For I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. Interesting, huh? Yes, Pastor, it is. Yeah, I thought so too. <laughs> it seems that they're appealing to Roman law at this point. In incidentally, this isn't a new, a new charge. In verse 13, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. This isn't a new charge. It's something similar that had already been alleged. We saw in chapter 16, verses 20 and 21, uh, them being Jews exceedingly, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. They teach customs which are not lawful for us being Romans to receive or observe. It's already been said before. Again, remember, Rome had banished the Jews from the city. And now we have these Jews here causing problems. See, Judaism as a religion was tolerated. So Paul was uh, bringing something that was new to them. It was a new religion and was not recognized by Rome is what they're saying. But Gallio didn't want any part of the religious quarrel. So he drives them out. What's a blessing here is God had said, I'll be with you. And Paul didn't even have to defend himself. himself. Now, Sosthenes is interesting because notice what happened to him. It says in verse 17, the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio took no notice of these things. Sosthenes, he got flogged. It would seem that these, these Gentiles, these Greeks, were tired of the problems that they were having to deal with, and they just took it out on this guy, Sosthenes. But what's interesting, and I'll say this quickly here, Sosthenes may very well have been converted. And the reason I say that is because in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 
when Paul is introducing uh, the letter in chapter 1, verse 1, it reads, Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. So his initial rejection and punishment may have led to his conversion. Well, verse 18, Paul still remained a good while. He took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off in Sancreia, for he had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. After he had spent some time there, he departed and went over the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. So he leaves Corinth after a year and a half. It says here, and I'll just touch this very briefly, well, in Sincrea, he shaved his head, making a vow of the Nazareth. Um, when you look in the Old Testament, there is a group of people, it's, a, it's not so much a group of people, there's what is called the vow of the Nazareth. And what would take place is you would be separated from certain things for a certain amount of time in order that you might demonstrate yourself to be completely devoted to the things of God. In Numbers 6, verses 1 through 4, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazareth, to separate themselves to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. In verse 18, it says, The Nazareth shall shave the head of his separation at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall take the hair of the head of his separation, put it in the fire, which is under the sacrifice of the peace offerings. And so that was part of what they would do when they took the vow of consecration. As it was concluded, they would burn that hair that had been shaved as a symbol of that consecration. And so that's basically what he's doing there. He had taken a vow, and, and the rest is uh, what we just saw. Now, this is where we introduce Ephesus. Notice verse 19. He came to Ephesus. Ephesus is the main city in what was then called Roman Asia. It was located on a river, and it was the home of a temple, the Temple of Artemis. Paul left his traveling companions in Ephesus. He went to a synagogue in order to once again reason. He just couldn't resist continuing his attempts to reach his people. They asked him to stay, as it says, but he could not. He was going to Jerusalem. He was going to fulfill his vow. So it says in verse 22 that he landed at Caesarea and he went up and greeted the church. Now, Paul had preached to Cornelius in Caesarea and a church had been birthed there. We saw that in the book of Acts in chapter 10. And so he goes back to this region, to this place called Caesarea. And uh, basically, he's going to minister. He went to Antioch, and that completed what was called the second missionary journey. He spent some time there, he went over all the region, and after resting, he departed on what is called his third missionary journey. As this is happening, verse 24, a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside, explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross the Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from Scripture that Jesus is the Christ. Now, I want to speak to you about this man, Apollos. 
Apollos arrives at Ephesus and he begins to build on the foundation that the Apostle Paul had laid. So here we have the possibility of dissension and comparison. Remember, I said this earlier, Romans 15, 20, Paul said, I have strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Apollos is coming and he's adding his insight and ministry to that which has already begun through the ministry of Paul. And when you look at Apollos, he's an impressive individual, and he had what would be called a powerful resume. What we have an opportunity of seeing in this passage here is the training of a man of God. Now, who is this man? Who is this young man with such advantages and so much potential? Well, we get to see who he is. One, Luke tells us he's Jewish. He was born and he was raised in a place called Alexandria, Egypt. Now, during this time, there were approximately one million Jews living in Alexandria. The Jews who lived there spoke Greek, and they had the Jewish scriptures translated into Greek. It had a large population, therefore it had an enormous synagogue. This was a man who could communicate to both Jew and Gentile with equal effectiveness. And that is a tremendous advantage in ministry. When you have a capacity to speak to two different cultures, I have to tell you that's a tremendous advantage. I have friends who are, have, have more than one cultural experience, and they know how. They know how to navigate communication and conversation. And I have to tell you, it, it is a tremendous advantage to a person who can do that. When I was in India many years ago now, I, was, I speak through interpreters. There's so many different dialects in, in, in India. It's a huge nation with many, many, many people, billion plus people. And so in the different regions, there'll be different dialects. And so I was in Southern India and I was teaching at a pastor's school, speaking to pastors. And I had to speak through an interpreter. And as I was speaking through the interpreter at the end of my teaching, the man who had invited me to come and to share approached me and he said, I need to have you do more things here because you have a gift, you have the capacity to speak through an interpreter. And, and unless you've done that, you'll know that it can be difficult if you don't have a capacity or haven't learned to do that because every language has a different cadence. Every language has a different amount of words that may be expressed in the same words you use. You may say four words, but in their language, it may be 12. And, and it's not as easy as it appears. But you see, I had an advantage because when I was a little boy growing up, my grandmother who came to the United States, my dad's mama, who came to the United States from, from Mexico at the turn of the 20th century, never learned to speak English. My grandmother didn't speak English. My grandmother died at the age of 92 and never became an American citizen. My grandmother died a green card Mexican. And so when I would go see my grandmother, I, my parents would not teach us Spanish. My parents did not speak Spanish to us. They were fluent, that was their first language, but they would not speak it to us. They wanted us to speak English only. And they kept a lot of secrets that way, at least they thought they did, we learned enough. <laughs> but when I would go to see my grandmother, she didn't speak any English. And we went every week as a little boy to see grandma. She only lived a mile and a half away. And we'd go see grandma every Saturday. She'd make us tortillas and breakfast. It was just great, great memories. But as we would go, my mom would sit next to me and I would converse with my grandmother. And I learned to speak through an interpreter when I was two, three, four, five years old. Because my, I would speak to my grandma and my grandma would speak back to me. My mom would translate, I'd pick up some words. And that's how it was all of my life. So I learned cadence. I learned how to listen. I learned how to hear a language and hear they speak this. So I, and that's how, and so there's an advantage to that. There's an advantage for me as an American when I go to Mexico to minister because my last name 
it's a disadvantage in some ways when you go through passport control and they see my last name, they speak Spanish to me and I say, un burrito por favor. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> or chata. And that's about it. <laughs> I'm playing. I speak a little more Spanish than that, but not much. But when I go, though I wasn't born in Mexico, I know enough of the culture to know the taboos. I know the things to do. I know the things I ought not to do. That's an advantage. And there is a great advantage and having the ability to communicate in this fashion here. And this is a man, Apollos, who could. Apollos had the ability to minister to Jew as well as to Gentile, to speak Greek as well as to speak in Hebrew. That's a tremendous, tremendous advantage. And he had that. It's a great advantage in ministry. Notice also that he's described as being eloquent in speech. That means that he was a man of what is called, it used to be a man of letters is what it used to be referred to. He was skilled in literature. He was skilled in the arts, in history. He was a man skilled in speech. He was a man who was rational. He was a man who was wise. This is a man who's impressive. He's respectable. This is a cultured man, the kind of man that people would notice. Alexandria was the second most important city in the Roman Empire. It was an educational center. It trained students in matters of literature and philosophy. That means that he had the background to engage intellectuals in religion. That's an advantage. A third thing, he was culturally and socially sophisticated. Again, as a large city with a variety of cultures, Alexandria was cosmopolitan. It was the home of the Lighthouse of Alexandria, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. That lends itself to ministry because when you've experienced a lot of things, you're not easily impressed. You just aren't. You just aren't. I never realized the advantage that the Lord has given to me by one, by a dad who didn't get impressed. My father didn't get impressed with, with people. And he, he taught me that. I don't either. You know, if somebody's doing some great thing, I think that's, that's good. But I don't run around saying, oh, God, I wish I could do that. I just think that's good. I'm glad he does. But I don't, I don't get it. My dad used to say it like this, David, I put my pants on one leg at a time, and so does he. That was my dad. So I'm the same way. So if somebody brags to me, I smile. That's nice. I'm not impressed, you know. And I've been places, you know, and I'm not, I don't, I've had a chance over the last many years to see a lot of things that people haven't seen just because they haven't had the opportunity or advantage to do that. I've seen the Taj Mahal. You know, you see those pictures of the Taj Mahal. Oh, I've got to go. It's dirty. <laughs> it's dirty. And they have this fountain in the front. It's muddy. I've seen... I've seen the Eiffel Tower. I've seen uh, the Tower of London. I, I, I've seen the castles in, in Spain. I, I, I've been around the world more than once. I've seen a lot. And because I've seen a lot and a lot of places, I spent three months in, in Europe backpacking. You know, I went through 11 countries when I was 25, 24 years old. I went through a lot of countries. I saw a lot of things in a lot of countries, Belgium, France, Germany, Austria, Switzerland. I've been on Lake Geneva. I've, I've seen a lot. And you know what happens? You don't get impressed. You just say, yeah, that's nice. When you first go there, you go, oh, wow, that's so beautiful. Then you see something that's even more beautiful. Wow. And then finally you say, that's nice. And that's kind of what happened. But you know, <laughs> I don't want to knock it. I mean, it's wonderful. I keep going back to Israel. That's the one place I love going. I love going there. Why? Because Jesus meets me in a special way in Israel. That's why I like to go there because I get something new every time I go. But I'm saying that to say this, when he experienced so much, he had so much culture, so much education, he's so eloquent, it, it, he just doesn't get impressed, which is a good thing, because it keeps you humble. Because what really impresses you is gonna be the Lord and the things of God. And again, that lends itself to ministry. He was not easily impressed. A fourth thing, 
He's mighty in scripture. He was raised in Egypt, but he received an in-depth instruction in the Old Testament. He was an expert in the reading and interpretation of the Old Testament writings. That had made him open to the gospel. And then in verse 25, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord. He had a rudimentary understanding of the mission of John the Baptist. He knew the baptism of repentance. He knew that Messiah was to come, but he didn't know the significance of the death of Christ, his resurrection, or the sending of the Spirit. A sixth thing, he's fervent in spirit, and he spoke and taught accurately. He was passionate in his presentation, and he spoke and taught accurately that which he knew. He was diligent, and he was sincere as he studied the word of God. The problem is, Apollos had come to Ephesus and built on Paul's foundation. Paul had already been in Ephesus. He had laid the foundation. He didn't remain there. He left Priscilla and Aquila behind. And here comes Apollos. And he promptly begins to share the little that he knows. I want to develop this with you, and then we'll roll to a conclusion. In verse 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Priscilla and when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Here we see one of the most important earmarks of a person who loves the Lord. This is one of the most important earmarks of a man of God. He was confronted and had the humility to receive further instruction. And that is precisely where many young and promising ministers fall most often. They think because they're effective that they are very anointed. And they fall prey to the temptation of pride and the danger of outward success. Not only they, but their audience believes them to be very anointed. Again, that gives way to pride and error becomes accepted as truth. He was educated, eloquent, cultured, religious, fervent, accurate, and bold. On the weight of charisma and zeal, his ministry would have been a hit amongst men. And people have a tendency of making choices based on outer appearance or likability. Remember, the Apostle Paul suffered with this kind of burden. It says in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 10, his letters are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak. His speech is contemptible. When he was compared to Apollos, Apollos came out on top. Paul was weighty. Paul was impressive. Apollos didn't even know the full gospel. And yet later on, we're going to see a problem developed. And so we have this older couple, Aquila and Priscilla. He's a tent maker. What does he know? Taken aside a brilliant, charismatic, intellectual, cultured, promising, eloquent young man, and there's this older couple in the church looking at him, and they're looking at each other, and Aquila is looking at Priscilla, and he's saying, "I got to take this boy aside. He's got promise, but he doesn't know." everything yet. Now here's the thing. The earmark of a person who is going to be used by God is whether or not they can be corrected. If they cannot be corrected, they are dangerous. They're dangerous. I've been in ministry a long time now. I have been the young man and I'm not anymore. And I can tell you that in my own ministry experience, one of the things that I've said to those who have, I've taught to be pastors was one of the words you don't want to use with somebody is they've got great potential. Because I've seen many with great potential fail because they didn't live up to it, because they had success too quickly. And people began to think, oh, he's likable. Because personality drives churches today. He's enthusiastic. He's got a lot of personality. He's excitable. That drives people today. But they're not listening to what's being said. And because they don't listen to what's being said or they can't track with what's being said, what ends up being is 
they, be, they become deceived. And then some person like me approach and say, you know, which I do on occasion, and I'll say, you know, I wanted to t tell you that, you know, I really appreciate, you know, your zeal, but you probably need to know this. The ones who will listen, they have great promise. The ones who won't, they're very dangerous. I just had a conversation with one young pastor just last week. I meet with 20 to 28 pastors every month. I disciple and mentor them, 20 to 28 pastors every month. And one was sitting next to me, and I was talking to him, and I was telling him, you look out for this, you look out for that, you look out for this, why are you doing that? And he looks at me with big old eyes, because I treat him like my son, and I speak to him like he is, because I'm concerned that he doesn't get caught up in the wrong kinds of things. And he listens. And when he listens, that's wisdom. Because he's listening to somebody who has been teaching for 43 years. I may know something. I may have some experience that I can give to you. And if you have wisdom, you'll listen. And he does. I have others that I've spoken to and I've said, listen, I'm concerned. And they'll say, yeah, yeah, that's good. Because I'm successful. I got people showing up. Everything's going good. If I changed, I'd lose them all. But what are you feeding them? What are you teaching them? Are you showing them Jesus Christ? Are you showing them yourself? Listen, your testimony may be wonderful, but it doesn't last that long. You've got to be building on the things that you began, or you're going to start going over the same thing over and over and over again, and you're never going to bring them the new or fresh manna. God wants them to have fresh meat, not old. So teach them the truth and grow in the things of the Lord. This is what's happening where Aquila and Priscilla are there listening and they're saying, this man is very zealous. He's got, he's got all this eloquence. He's, he's the kind of person that keeps you spellbound. You love what, but he's looking at his wife and he's saying, we need to take this young man aside. And he does. Notice what happens. They took him aside, verse 26, and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So what happens? That's where the wisdom comes in. That's why Apollos could eventually be used greatly by the Lord. You see, again, Aquila was a tent maker, not a theologian. And so I see him as a kindly older man, taking aside a younger, zealous man. And he shared with him, and he ministered to him, and he taught him the way of the Lord more accurately. He mentored him is what he did. And mentoring is the key to spiritual growth. It produces a relationship of accountability. In, in, the years, in the years that I've ministered, on many occasions, I've offered times to young pastors. And normally, I'll say, I'll meet with you. If you'd like, I'll get coffee with you. I'm turned down. They simply believe they already have it pretty much under control. And that's sad. In Proverbs 19, verse 20, listen to counsel, receive instruction, that you may be wise in your latter days. Well, eventually this is what happens. Verse 27, when he desired to cross the Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. He vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing them from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. He received instruction, demonstrated humility, and the result was a good report. He was used greatly, became a tremendous preacher of the gospel of grace, and his impact was so great that he eventually was compared to the mighty apostle Paul. And sadly, it was the Corinthians who began to compare Paul with Apollos. And some even began taking sides concerning him, asking the question, which one is the best teacher? But Paul handled it like this in 1 Corinthians 3, 4 through 6. When one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. One last thought. I think you give honor where honor is due. I appreciated my pastor and I loved him as deeply as a son in the faith could love a pastor. I gave honor to him. But I also knew that my pastor wasn't Jesus. There's only one God, there's only one 
Savior, and that's Jesus. And we need to keep that in mind too. Amen? Yes. Amen. And so when they began to argue amongst themselves who was the greatest, Paul said, wait a minute. I do one thing, Apollos does the other, but it's God who gets all the glory. And if we keep our eyes on Jesus, we'll keep our pastors in the right place also.